Uh, there's just this, this metaphor, this picture that's used throughout Scripture. Uh, and it's the idea of a kingdom. A kingdom. It says in Colossians, the first chapter, that when you became a Christian, you were delivered out of the kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of his son. And it's, and it's especially in the Gospel of Matthew, it is so frequently used to help us better understand our relationship with God and how we're supposed to be living this life. And we decided that maybe one of the best things we can do at the beginning of the year is just take a step back and look at some of the key kings that we find in the Bible to better understand this whole idea of, of what a king's role is and uh, what a kingdom's like and what we're supposed to be and do, right? So we started off last week, uh, Seth preached a sermon on King Saul, the first king of Israel. This morning, I get the, the privilege of talking about the greatest king in the Old Testament, greatest human king, and that would be King David. I mean, by all counts, uh, both New Testament and Old Testament, they keep coming back and pointing to King David. Well, in my estimation, it's impossible for me to try to cover the life of King David. So what I want to try to do this morning is simply look at one little story in King David's life that, in again, in my view, it kind of epitomizes or encapsulates or, or illustrates well what his whole life was all about, at least the good qualities of his life. I mean, David had his problems just like everybody else did, but David's also called a man after God's own heart. And there's a lot in King David that, that I think we can learn from. And there's one just basic lesson that, to me anyway, kind of rises above all else. And, and let me tell you why. Because this, this story I'm going to uh, review with you this morning is found in 2 Samuel chapter 23. And you can go back later on and check me out on this and, and look at some of the details that I don't have time to go into this morning. But in 2 Samuel 23, most Bibles start that chapter off. And the heading will say something like King David's final words. And you've got the, one of the last speeches that King David gives. And then it goes on and it talks about a couple more things that I find so interesting. But in that context, we are winding down, right? We're getting towards the very end of King David's life. And usually at a memorial service, you go to a funeral, when, when people tell a story about the person that you're, you're celebrating their life, right? At a, at a funeral. Usually you don't just tell some random story. Usually you try to pick a story that kind of epitomizes the kind of person they were. And to me, the placement of the story, as well as the content of the story, really, I think, deserves our attention. So here, here we go, 2 Samuel chapter 23. You find in the context, David says his final words, and then we're going to back up, and we're just going to kind of review a little bit of, of King David's life. And the first thing we're hit with I mean, we're really hit with this. David was a military leader. He wasn't just a great king as far as uh, ruling his people. He was a great king of conquest. And the Bible is very much up front with that. And we're going to come back and address that. But one of the ways it emphasizes that at the end of David's life is, talks about his loyal warriors. And we're going to call these guys the mighty men of David. And there are three mighty men that kind of rise above the rest. Their names are Joshua, Eleazar, and Shema. And some of the escapades, some of the accomplishments, I find fascinating. Stories, stories like, like hundreds of men come out, and there's only one of these mighty men. And guess who wins? It's, it's the mighty man. It, you know, his story is, I, I know this is an assignment. But as a kid, I always loved these kind of stories. And one of the things I found out later on is historians and archaeologists have actually discovered that in, in a world where the typical man wouldn't even be six foot tall, right, on average, some of these guys who were designated as mighty men would be six foot eight, six foot ten, four hundred pounds. I mean, they were literally giants of their day, right? And so not only were they skilled at fighting, they just, they just hands down had, had everything going for them before the battle even started. Well, anyway, we've got three of the greatest of these men and they are introduced to us, as well as the, the uh, 30 other mighty men who are very loyal to David. And then we have this one simple story, but I, I, I'm just going to be honest with you, I think it's profound. So here's the story. It talks about something that happened earlier in David's reign. And it's at a time when the Philistines, one of the major armies that David had conflict with, the Philistines had actually taken over Bethlehem. Bethlehem's just down the road from, from Jerusalem. But Bethlehem's also David's hometown. So knowing that, here's David's hometown, and his enemy has actually occupied his hometown. 
And David is just kind of musing. He's, he's, uh, it records for us that David makes this statement. He says, oh, that someone would bring me a drink of water from the well of Bethlehem. And, and most commentators, and if you're reading this story, you get, the, you get the flavor of, he's not telling anybody to do this. It's not a command. It's not even a request. He's just uh, reminiscing. Uh, you know, I don't know about you, but when you think about home, there are usually certain things about your childhood or where you were brought up. You know, sometimes, sometimes uh, when you go visit a lot of different places, water tastes weird at certain places, right? And so sometimes you just miss the way the water tasted at home, right? I, I could go on in this, but I think you get the idea. So David, in all likelihood, is just reminiscing, musing, just thinking out loud, right? And he's missing his hometown. And so he says, oh, this someone would bring me some water from the well at Bethlehem. I, I, I've got, before I go further, I've got to say, though, there might be. In fact, there's, there's probably a pretty good indication here that there's more going on than just David missing his hometown. Think about this. He's king, and he's a military king. And as a military king, things are not going well. How do you know they're not going well? Because even his hometown is being occupied at this time. In other words, a lot of commentators, I, I incline, I'm inclined to agree with them think that David's more than just reminiscing about the water at Bethlehem. David's also feeling depressed. And he might be saying something to the extent, what kind of king am I? I can't even get a drink of water from my hometown. Because the enemies have taken it over, right? So, so he's at least thinking about his hometown. Maybe, maybe there's more to it than that, but here's where the story starts. David makes that statement, and three guys over here make that statement. It's Joseph Eleazar, and Shema. And they decide, we're going to get David some water from the well of Bethlehem. But wait a minute, the enemies, that, that's a stronghold. It's occupied. That's okay, these guys are, I told you, they're mighty men, right? The mighty men go, and they break through the stronghold. And this is where I could waste a lot of time, and I'm not going to, but I can just picture how two guys hold off hundreds. Well, the third guy lowers the skin or the, or the jar or whatever he's going to pull the water out from. And then they successfully bring the water back to David. And they're going to present it to him. And the story's almost over. But, but I want you to get the significance of this. Because what happened was, you, you know, your wish is my command. It's kind of like David didn't order us to do this, but we know he wanted it. So we're going to do it anyway. It talks about the loyalty of these, of these great words. But it's more than that. And, and here's, here's what I want you to think about. Let's say... I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss for this, but let's say we've got a terrible enemy of the United States, right? And let's say the leader of that enemy, and just for purposes of illustration this morning, I'm going to call him Putin, because that name comes to mind, right? And let's say that Putin says to some of his men, some of his Secret Service men, he says, you know what, I'd love to have a can of Coke before I go to bed tonight, Coca-Cola, right? But I would love to have a can of Coca-Cola from the refrigerator in the Oval Office in Washington, D.C. <laughs> and so before he drinks his, his cola, before he goes to bed tonight, his Secret Service breaks in the Oval Office in Washington, D.C. and pulls up, I don't even know if they have Coca-Cola in anyway, whatever. Anyway, they break in and they get the refrigerator and they pull up a can of Coca-Cola and they bring it back and Putin drinks that. Okay. It's more than him drinking a can of Coca-Cola. He's made a statement, hasn't he? Because where he got it from. Listen, when these guys come back with the water from Bethlehem, listen, the enemy may have Bethlehem, but they're not going to have it very long. We just made a statement. You can't even keep three guys from breaking in and pulling water out of your... What I'm trying to say is this is more than just David tasting water from his hometown. This is one of those moments where everybody in the army has got to be going, yes, pretty soon we're going to have that territory back. And by the way, they did. They did get that territory back. But let's go back to the story. They break through the stronghold. They get the water. They bring it to David. David looks at the water. And I don't know if he was dying to drink it or not, but he looks at the water. And he says, how can I drink Something that represents the lifeblood of men who are loyal to me. I'm going to give it to God. Okay, how do you give something to God? 
In Old Testament times, this was well understood. It might seem weird to us, but it's well understood. It's called a libation. It'd be a drink offering. And the way you gave something to God was you poured it out on the ground. When you pour a drink out on the ground, no human is ever going to be able to drink that. I mean, it's not like you can dig through the dirt and get the water back out, right? You, no human lips are ever going to touch that. But in so stating, the reason you did it is because you wanted to give it to God. And the way you give it to God is you don't keep any of it for yourself. That's it. Very simple, but I'd submit to you extremely profound. And I really think our world would do well to listen to this. If you understand who God is, he doesn't deserve something from you. He deserves everything from you. And in my estimation, what made David such a great man of God is the fact that he understood if you're in, you've got to be all in. I, I, I just want to take that simple thought, and I really do want to think about it a little bit and let it be a challenge to us. And I won't spend much time on it, but I'm going to put that off to the end. I want to back up and talk about something totally different for just a minute. Because, again, in my estimation, this is the elephant in the room, at least in the modern West. How in the world can David be such a great godly man and be a man of bloodshed and war? So many people today, maybe, maybe you've not heard this. Uh, I, I read it all the time. I hear, watch it on YouTube. I hear people say something to the extent there's so much violence, there's so much bloodshed shed that's endorsed by God. I can't believe in a God like that. I can't follow a God like that. This whole concept of war, fighting, violence, bloodshed, how do we as Christians bring that in line with, with what the scripture says, right? How do we understand that? I, I think this is worth taking some time. There's a few steps I want you to take with me mentally. And I actually think the first step is the most important. Here it is. How does what the Bible has to say, or, or, or the comments made in the Bible about warfare, violence, and legend, how does that prove that Jesus didn't rise from the dead? That's my question. How does violence, bloodshed, and everything that God says about that recorded scripture, how does that prove that Jesus didn't rise from the dead? You might think that a very weird question, but can I explain my reasoning here? Jesus made his resurrection, rising from the dead, the sign of his entire ministry. You remember how he did this? I, I, I know he, he gave so many different signs. I mean, walking on the water, uh, taking one little lunch and feeding 5,000 men plus women and children. I mean, stopping a funeral procession, bringing somebody back to life. Somebody's been blind from birth and giving them sight. I mean, Jesus did thing after thing after thing that, that had people scratching their head. They're like, this, this could be no normal man, right? Only God can forgive sins, and he did miracles to prove that he can forgive sins. In so many ways, he proved that. But when he was asked for a special sign, Jesus said, I'm not going to give you the kind of signs. And you, you know, a crooked, adulterous generation seeks these kind of signs. There's only one major sign that you're going to get. What is it? It's the sign of Jonah. What's the sign of Jonah? Like Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, and then came back up. So the Son of Man will be in the belly of the earth for three days. Then he's going to come back to life. In so many words, in many different ways, Jesus pretty much said, you can believe everything I've done and everything I've said because I'm going to prove it to you. And he also said, if I don't rise from dead, then ignore it all. In so many words, that's what he said. He, he rested everything on it. And why? Yeah, I, I know we've talked about this before, but it, it, just, just indulge me for a minute here. Why is that so significant? Because people don't come back to life. We all know. I mean, it's a big obstacle to some people, but that's the point. It should be a big, big obstacle because it is true. People don't just spontaneously come back to life after they've been dead for three years. Three years. Three days. Three days, especially after the flogging and everything else that he experienced. That just does not happen. And that is the point because he's not just a man. And that's what the proof is. It's proving him to be more than a man. It's actually proving him to be God. In fact, in fact, time and time again, there are a lot of atheists and agnostics and people who just don't care, uh, the apathies. I mean, there's, there's so many people that just don't care about stuff. But some people are aggressively against Christianity. 
And some of them have set out to try to disprove Christianity to the world. They don't just want to be over here and not believe it. They actually want to be against Christianity. And the people who really get into that find out sooner or later, somewhere along the process, that one of the things that they have to address is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? Because he, he based everything on the resurrection. So if you want to disprove Christianity, you must deal with his claims and the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. And here's what we find. Some people have just given up and gone away. But many of the people, and I can give you a long list of these people, many of these people who have actually taken the time to actually look at the evidence to disprove Christianity have looked at the evidence of resurrection and actually converted to Christianity. Why? Because it proves him to be God. Not just somebody special, but God. Now, can I come back to my question? How does what the Bible say uh, teach us and comment on and all the information about warfare bloodshed. How does that disprove that he rose from the dead? Well, it doesn't. The evidence for his resurrection is overwhelming. He rose from the dead. What does that prove? It proves he's God. And if he's God, it doesn't make any difference what he says about anything. He's God. So, connect the dots here. Even if I don't like what he says, even if I don't understand what he says, I'm just a human. He's God. Obviously. He's got some reasons that maybe I just don't understand. What I find encouraging, I'm not hiding behind this, because what I find encouraging is God actually does explain a lot of this. And that's what I'm going to get to in the next few steps. But before I get there, i got to make this point first. Are you following me? He's God. So whatever he says about war, whatever he says about human sexuality, whatever he says about greed, whatever he says about anything, He's God. End of story. Sometimes I'm going to understand it. Sometimes I'm going to agree with it. Sometimes I'm going to dislike it. But he's God. And if he's God, I've got to submit to him. Okay, that's, that's the first step. Here's the second step. So the first step is he's God. It, right? Let's, let's, let's respect that. Step number two is this. All that I'm hearing today, and, 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 and I'll admit that maybe I'm a little skewed here, but I have been doing a lot of reading for this because of a class that I'm supposed to, that I, that I have the opportunity to teach over at the Bible College. I've been doing a lot of reading on this, and I'm telling you that there's, there's a lot of, in my estimation, I'm going to call it propaganda. But there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot being said about violence and warfare and bloodshed in the name of Christianity. It is just not true. It is just not true. It has been so overstated. And you know, just like propaganda, you repeat the silliest things and you say them enough, people start believing you. And so, yeah, full disclosure here, I grew up listening to guys, comedians like a guy named George Carlin. I don't know if that, I don't know if that name rings a bell with anybody or not. George Carlin says the reason that we have so much bloodshed and warfare, it's all because of religion. If we religion, life would be better. There's this old musician, his name's John Lennon. I doubt that anybody's ever heard of him, but John Lennon wrote this song called Imagine. In this song called Imagine, he wanted to imagine a world that would be peaceful and beautiful. No way you could have that kind of world if we're in a world where there's no religion. And then everybody could live in harmony. And this, this idea is perpetuated in so many different ways because people think, oh yeah, uh, fighting in Northern Ireland, the Crusades, all the bloodshed, done throughout history, in the name of religion. If we just got rid of religion, everybody would get along. Okay, that's, that's the propaganda. Can I, can I give you at least some facts? Back in 2004, there was an encyclopedia, several volumes encyclopedia put out by two historians, and it's on the history of human warfare. They went back and chronicled all the wars and major fighting that has hidden, been recorded in written history of humanity. According to this encyclopedia, there's 1,763. 1,763 major wars or major battles where a lot of lives have been lost in the history of written, in written history of humanity, right? Of that, how, how, how many of those battles do you think were over religious or specifically Christian issues. Well, if you listen, if you listen to the propaganda, you would think, well, most of them somehow, some way, get back to faith issues. Okay, here's here's what they found: 1,763 wars. It's not a majority of the wars. It's not even a significant portion. 
In fact, 93%, 93% of all the wars in human history have nothing to do with faith and religion at all. 93%. Okay, well, that, that leaves us with 7%, doesn't it? And I'm going to deal with that in just a minute, but I'm not done with the statistics over here. Because a lot of people will say, okay, okay, uh, maybe it's not numbers as far as numbers of wars, but surely body count, right? As far as the number of people who die. Because, I mean, just think of the Crusades and all the terrible things. I mean, there are certain things that people just keep throwing up as though they're proof time and time again. And the Crusades is one of them, right? And they say, well, surely the numbers of people who died in these religious conflicts, surely that's significant. Okay, let's go over this. As far as loss of human life is concerned, you know which war people lost more lives than any other war? That'd be World War II. World War II, as far as body count and number of lives lost. By the way, I, I sure don't want to sound disrespectful the way I'm rattling this off. I am upset, and I am a little emotional about this, but loss of human lives is loss of human life. I mean, no disrespect by that. It's an awful thing. But since I'm emotional, let me just go ahead and tell you this anyway. The most loss of human life in World War II doesn't hold a candle to what Stalin and Mao did to their own people. As far as loss of human life goes, you talk about the millions of people put to death. And that has nothing to do with religious faith. In fact, it's directly tied to getting rid of religious faith, that they murdered all those people. But let me get back to the wars. Most loss of human life would be World War II. That'd be number one. Number two would be the Mongolian conflict. Number three would be World War I. Number four would be the Three Kingdom War that took place in China. And the number five, six, seven, eight, nine have nothing to do with religious conflicts at all. You have to get down to number 10. Number 10 is not the Crusades. It was a battle that took place a few hundred years ago in Europe. And in many ways, it had written all over it religious conflicts. So a lot of people call it a religious battle. So down to number 10, but it doesn't hold a candle to the number of lives lost at the top of the list. All I'm trying to say, all I'm trying to say is, this is terribly misrepresented. People want you to think that's the source of most bloodshed. It is not. It is not. Now, having said that, I want to move on to the next step. Because some lives have been lost in religious conflict. No doubt about it. So here's the next question I want to ask. How much of that fighting, specifically in the name of Christ, how much of that is consistent with what Christ taught? Do you understand the question I'm asking here? Because anybody can go out and say, I'm going to kill you in the name of Christ. Is that really what Christ wanted? I mean, can you base that on his teaching? Do you understand what I'm asking here? We've not, we've not only gotten to the place where it's significantly less than the way it's been represented, but actually look at what's going on here. And this is going to open up a whole can of worms because the first crusade does not fit into what took place with the rest of the crusades. But in the rest of the crusades, there was much taking place in the name of Christ that should have never happened. And it's not consistent with what Christ taught. I, I'm just going to say it that way in the interest of time. If you want to talk more about it, I'm more than happy to. But I'm finally down to the point where I want us to deal with there are some battles... There are some wars that have taken place that actually is consistent with what God said because you find it in the Bible, God specifically telling people like King David, I want you to go in, or Joshua, I want you to go in and wipe those people out. It's there. It's not the way other, everybody would represent it, but it's there. How do we respond to that? Well, I'm so thankful that God actually gave us some insight into and you know where you find it? You find it in Genesis chapter 15. In Genesis 15 chapter, God's talking to a guy named Abraham. Abraham is the father uh, of the nation, right? Father Abraham, right? He says, through your descendants, all the nations of the world will be blessed. But also, your descendants are going to be like the sand on the seashore. Remember all those promises? So it's your descendants that we're talking about here. That would be Israel later on. And God tells Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, I want you to know you're going to have a lot of ancestors. I mean, you're going to have a lot of offspring, right? You're going to have a lot of lineage here. But I also want you to know what's going to happen to them. They're going to be slaves for 400 years in captivity. And the first thing that, you know, God's probably already knows where Abraham's mind is going, because first thing you think, why? 
Why do they have to be slaves? And why so long? And here's what God says next. They're going to be slaves for 400 years. And the reason it's 400 years is because the iniquity or the sin of those living in Canaan has not yet, had not yet reached the level. Can, can, can I say this again? God said the reason he's going to wait so long and they have to stay in captivity so long is because the sins of the Canaanite were not yet great enough. You, you, you know what that tells us? Before you're probably already connected to us, but before I get there, I can't help but to think, you know, if you're an Israelite living in Egyptian captivity and it's been 385 years, and there you are in captivity, you're probably praying prayers like, God, why is it taking so long? You know, have you forgotten about us? And it just reminds me so many times in our prayer lives, we only see what's going on around us. There's a bigger picture here. It kind of gets me back to point one. He's God. He's the only one who sees everything. But more pointedly, why did it take 400 years? Because the sin of the Canaanite hadn't gotten to the point yet of what? Of deserving of the punishment. In other words, God did not indiscriminately say, go ahead and wipe those people out and take the land. No. God waited until a people needed to be taken out because of their great sin. Do you understand? He wasn't just giving his people a land. He wasn't just saying, go over and take those people. He was exercising judgment on a people that needed to be judged. Okay, I, I know this is a whole other issue for some other people, but for, for, for a lot of people as far as carrying out judgment in this life. But, but I want to go on record as saying, praise God that he doesn't wait to judge everybody till the end. And the reason, the reason I want to say that, let, let, let me back up just a little bit here. There was a book I read a couple of years ago. It's by a guy named Ben Shaw. Great little book called Seven Reasons to Reconsider Christianity. It's a great little book of evidences. I highly recommend it. Just a little paperback. In this book, he tells a story about when he's in Bible college and he's sitting there one day in a class where they're reading through some of these Old Testament scriptures that talk about going in and wiping out all these people. And one of the students raised his hand and said, I thought God was a God of love. And the professor kind of puts down his Bible, takes his glasses off, you know, comes around the front of the desk and, and just, just talks very, very sincerely to the students for a minute. He says, you know what? He says, I, I really want you to get this. He said, throughout the history of the world, and even today, it's only people in the modern West who really have problems with this. There are people living in, in North Korea today, parts of Africa today, that are probably sincerely praying that God would bring a war, that God would bring judgment on some evil empire, some dictatorship, some some communistic regime that has just so oppressed the people that it, that it crushes the life out of them. He said, in the modern West, we pray that we get an A on the final exam. In much of the world, they just pray that their children don't die off in the next decision made by the government. Listen, I really do think we ought to praise God that sometimes, sometimes we don't have to wait to the end. Sometimes he intervenes. And sometimes he intervenes through just wars. There's a time and a place which kind of brings me back to David. Because what David epitomizes for us is there's a time and a place and if you've given God your all, you're willing to give him whatever it is. There's, a, there's another book that I've just been reading recently. It's by a professor. Her name is Nancy Pierce. It's a great little book. It's called The Toxic War on Masculinity. And she opens, there's two different things in this book I want to share with you, but the, she opens with a story. It's, a, it's, a, it's one of these news stories. Maybe you remember hearing about this. It took place, I think, in 2019, not, not too long ago, but it was in Thousand Oaks, California. There was, a, there was a young man, 20, 28 years old, I believe, late 20s. He'd already been divorced. He'd already lost his job. He'd been in the military for a while. Nothing seemed to work out in his life. He's back home living with his mom, depressed. Depressed. At the local bar and grill, they, they had a college night, and he knew it would be packed that night. So he got his pistol, he put on his hoodie, he got some, got 
of some smoke grenades. And he went down when it was crowded in the evening. He threw those smoke grenades in to disorient people. And he pulled out his, his pistol and started shooting. Before it was done, he killed 12 people. And he turned a gun on himself. And the way the media covered this story, they presented it, at least some of them in the media, presented it as a classic case of toxic masculinity. Here's what happened when somebody, here's what happens when somebody has too much testosterone, it's not under control, and people die. And they just, they wanted to really make a point of this, right? Well, Dr. Piercy goes back and looks at that exact same story and says, you know what, there was some masculinity out of control that caused some evil that night. But if you look at the facts, there was also eight men in that restaurant that night who took the women and children and hugged them under the tables and put their backs to the shooter. That was also masculinity showing itself in a way that saved lives. In fact, there was one guy there, his name was Matthew. He threw a chair through the window because there wasn't an exit on this side of the room and they'd been kind of uh, uh, closed off by the shooter. Threw a, threw a chair through the window, was getting people out as best he could, when he could, but he stayed. And one of the women who survived that night said she couldn't, she couldn't imagine why he kept putting his life on the line time and time again. It's as though he had no regard for his own wife because he was so concerned about others. And Matthew, who survived that night, was interviewed later. And his simple answer was, I know where I'm going. So this is what I got to do. You know what? Sometimes masculinity does get abused. But sometimes it gets channeled and used. Whatever it takes. To do what God wants. Here's, here's the other thing from that book. that It's not from any one page. In fact, there's at least four studies that she makes reference to. And they're, they're by different psychologists and sociologists, and they, they have to do with men, as you would guess, a book called The, War, the Toxic War on Masculinity. But in all these studies, it's about marriage relationships, it's about uh, uh, abuse in the home, it's about satisfaction in relationships, especially in uh, dating and marriage. And it goes through all these relationship studies that have been done. And in every single one of these studies that they've cited, that they focus on men, right? they have found consistently the guys who have the strongest marriages, the most satisfaction in their marriage, the best home life, all that stuff, consistently, they find out it's Bible-believing, church-going, committed Christian men. They consistently find that out. I I'm not done with this because that, I hope that doesn't surprise you. What gets said in church many times, though, is so mis misleading. Because in church, sometimes we say, you know, the divorce rate is just as high in church as it is outside of church. No, it's not. If you just qualify this with especially the men who are committed to Christ and show up all the time. The statistics are mind-blowing. Instead of it being one out of two that end in divorce, men in particular who are committed to their church and show up regularly, and there's some other factors that show commitment. I would call them all in men. It's about one out of 1,500 marriages. Do you see the difference in those statistics? Okay, here's the reason I'm sharing this with you. Because the opposite end of those same studies, the opposite end where you find the most abuse in the worst relationships, in the greatest degree of, of dissatisfaction and depression, all sorts of awful things, the opposite extreme is not what I would expect it to be. It's not the people who have no regard for God at all. No, the best, the best of the best in all these studies are men who are all in. The worst in all these studies are men who claim to be Christians and show up every now and then. But by all means, we call them nominal. You know what we mean by nominal? They claim it, they don't live it. They're there sometimes, but they're not really all in. It's not the guys who are rejected. All I'm, all I'm trying to say with this is, I'm, I'm just using men as an illustration. But all I'm trying to say is, Christianity is one of these things in life where you're either all in or you do anything. Those are the only choices that make sense. 
you know only one of those choices really makes sense. Here's the way Jesus said it. If you want to save your life and live for yourself, you're going to lose it. But if you're willing to lay down your life and give me your all, then you'll find it. Does that sound like all then? Does that sound like David? Does that sound like you? We have a time where we uh, come to the tables, participate in a very little meal together. Because Jesus told us when we gather together to remember. But according to 1 Corinthians 11, it also says at a time like this where we remember Jesus being all in on God's plan, it also says we're supposed to take this time to examine ourselves. Right? So when you think about Jesus today, I'm going to ask that you think about yourself. And where are you? Do you save a little water for yourself and give the rest to God? Or are you all?